Good afternoon, everybody. Nice to see you all. Uh, my name is Hal Roth. I direct the Contemplative Studies uh, program here at Brown, and I'd like to welcome you all to this afternoon's uh, seminar, a uh, virtual seminar. I want to give uh, begin by giving thanks to my colleagues, uh, Ann Hireman Hart and Srinivas Reddy for their invaluable work in helping to set this up. And of course, special guests to our uh, guest commentators today, uh, Deans uh, Carolyn Jacobs and Oliver Hill. Uh, since uh, many of you may not yet have heard of contemplative studies, it always gives me the opportunity to say a few words about it. And so I'll begin by doing that. Uh, we're a relatively new concentration um, and initiative at Brown, and we've come to serve as a model for many programs across the continent. Uh, we approach the study and teaching of contemplative practices and experiences from scientific, humanistic, and artistic uh, epistemologies and perspectives. And what this means is that we, we study the full range of both intentional and non-intentional uh, contemplative practices from traditional third person and second person perspectives that include the newest scientific research, um, uh, as well as developing a deep understanding of the cultural and historical context in which these practices have emerged. And in particular, we've also developed an innovative, what we call critical first person perspective, um, in which we teach contemplative practices in a classroom setting. Uh, this leads hopefully to the development of what uh, we call contemplative intelligence, uh, the practical knowledge of how to do contemplative practices, along with uh, the understanding of the various cultural, scientific, and ethical and political contexts through which these practices can be understood. And it's in this uh, last framework that we draw our inspiration uh, for our program today, uh, that we've organized as a, hopefully a small step um, in the major struggle that we're facing uh, to confront the systemic racism in our country, the recent events have uh, made us once again uh, only too painfully aware. People often think that contemplatives remain detached from society and either passively or even actively support the status quo. But there's a long tradition of social justice activism among contemplatives. Uh, Gandhi, uh, King, Mandela, yeah, each in their own way was a contemplative as well as a social activist and their activist sides are usually more uh, uh, studied and understood. So contemplative practices we maintain sustain our bodies and minds in the struggle. Contemplative sciences make these practices available to all people. Contemplative arts directly convey our suffering and joy and provide a vision of our unrealized potential Contemplative philosophies contextualize our efforts so we never lose our common humanity. Contemplative intelligence maximizes the influence of our efforts while supporting the wisdom and compassion with which we make them. Our commentators today are exemplars of contemplative social activism, each in their own sphere. Professor Carolyn Jacobs is Dean Emerita of the School of Social Work at Smith College in which uh, she served, for which she served in that capacity for 14 years. Uh, she uh, began um, when Ruth Simmons uh, was president of, of Smith. And Ruth, of course, went on to become the best president in the history of Brown University. Uh, and if you have not yet heard of Ruth Simmons or don't know Ruth Simmons, please Google her. Um, uh, and uh, Professor Oliver Hill is uh, Dean Emeritus of the College of Natural and Health Sciences um, at Virginia State University and an experimental psychologist of some repute. Uh, so we're delighted to welcome our speakers today. So just a, a, a final few words about the structure today. Um, uh, Professor Jacobs will speak first, uh, commenting on her, um, uh, her lecture here. Uh, and anything else she wants to uh, to do to bring things up to the present. Um, her lecture was in the spring of 2017. Um, and uh, then Professor Hill, uh, who spoke in the fall of 2017, uh, will also then uh, make some comments on his uh, public lecture and anything else he wants to do to bring things up to today. That will take approximately half an hour. Our moderator for this afternoon is my colleague and friend, Professor Srinivas Reddy. 
He'll have a couple of questions uh, to put uh, to Professor Jacobs and Professor Hill. Um, we ask that uh, as things are going on, that you put questions into the chat and we will pick questions out of the chat, call upon you uh, to ask the question uh, of uh, one of our speakers or both of our speakers, and we'll take it from there. If by some strange reason there are no questions in the chat, we'll ask you to use that, uh, that hand raising feature that you probably all are now familiar with in Zoom uh, from uh, various uh, Zoom meetings and courses and lectures that you have attended previously. So um, once again, as we always say with these Zoom events, uh, please bear with us. Uh, this is kind of a, a running experiment and sometimes we have connectivity issues uh, and such things, so please be patient. Um, so without uh, further ado, um, I will introduce Professor Reddy who will then introduce uh, our speakers. Should we just start, Professor Roth? Yeah, do you have any more words to say, Srini? Uh, nothing, but maybe I thought maybe we'd just do a, a two minute silent meditation to start. Um, it's a very nice group that we have here together. Um, some old friends and familiar faces and also some new friends. So uh, just two minutes. Uh, in Hindi, we say uh, do minute, two minutes. Uh, this is something that Gandhiji used to do uh, in his prayer meetings all the time. So. Just two minutes of silence, that's it. Uh, there's a bell to start and a bell to end. And uh, thank you so much for your presence. Thank you. Um, and now uh, over to uh, Dean Jacobs. Thank you so much. Uh, I uh, just saw Carolyn actually uh, speak with the Dalai Lama. So that was just, uh, I think, last week or, or not so long ago. And uh, she's also uh, <clears throat> been the interim president of uh, Mind and Life and on the board and deeply connected to that organization, which also has been uh, very intimately connected to contemplative studies. So. Thank you again, um, Carolyn Jacobs, Dean, Professor, and friend. Um, uh, so happy to hear what you would like to present to us. Thank you so much. And I love friend as a part of that. I think in today's world, we are so in need of friends. I Thank you, Hal, for inviting me back to reflect on um, my presentation in three years later. Um, I was looking at it, the title was Contemplative Studies Moving Forward During Challenging Times. I think, you know, today I would have said crisis, 
but I also am very conscious of thinking about, you know, in the, the sense of the Chinese, there's always that sense of danger and opportunity. And I think contemplative practices for me always keeps us open to the opportunities that may be before us. So as I looked at my presentation from 2017, and I must admit, I rarely go back looking at presentations. I just sort of go, oh, so this was uh, an experience. And I would say that I continue uh, believing deeply that contemplative practices can help us with our feelings of collective anger, grief, and sadness, and the reality of our isolation during COVID-19. I have found that conversations with families, friends, colleagues, and spiritual groups have moved from the overwhelming anxiety of social isolation and fears of contracting COVID-19 to the recent incidents of the murders of African American men and women by police. So while these murders and this pattern has had a long history since slavery, um, we are so much more aware based on the kind of isolation we've been in and the availability of social media where stories, uh, narratives, um, any sense of the reality of an event, we used to wait for a newspaper to report it and then, or a clip on television and you sort of go, oh, that happened, but it did it really. I think the visual of George Floyd, which we watched in so many ways, and then I found myself as an African-American woman, I said, I. I'm going to watch all three funerals because they were very different ones based on uh, being in um, uh, Minneapolis and then in North uh, Carolinas and then to Houston. But there was that power of homecoming, which is the expression in the African American tradition. It's not just that sense of, of death, but it's a sense of going home. And yet there's an energy in that that says there's still more work to do and a rededication to that work out of that kind of collective uh, grieving. I think the other thing that I have found so unusual during this time of having hours on Zoom calls, on meetings and connecting with people and then finding if phone calls and others that for my white friends and colleagues, it's that sense of why are blacks mad at me? I don't understand. I don't understand how to deal with this. Um, I wind up getting a lot of this because I do a fair amount of spiritual work with people. So they figure it's easy to ask the one who's doing that work because she's not going to attack and cut me off as easy as other Black friends will. And so I listened to pain from that end. And then as an African-American woman, I grew up in California and my family is there and here I am in Massachusetts. So their anxiety about my being here alone, meaning no African-American family within 3,000 miles uh, and aging and all of that, uh, I had to deal with holding their anxiety and saying, I'm fine. There are people who care about me. They happen to be white, but that's okay. Uh, it's, you know, we've worked this out over 40 some odd years that I've lived in Western Massachusetts. And, but our real concern was about the children in our family and particularly the young black men in our family. And so I listened to that anxiety, that concern, which is historical. I mean, this isn't the first year that Black families have been concerned about what's happening, particularly to Black boys. So it's been a, such a different experience of talking about 
hope, which I really, as I think about it now, I've not spent time talking about hope as I've talked about relationships and caring for and holding one another and a sense of a common humanity. I think that the issues of the last combination of COVID-19 and racism and acknowledging those are both pandemics that are long seated, some manifestations coming out at this time, particularly with COVID and knowing that it's mutated and other things and will continue to, but knowing how long racism has been and how much that has seeded and caused the kind of psychological illness, a lot of which in terms of the denial of resources, the health disparities and others have led to conditions of oppression, of racism being manifest in all of our systems in ways that it has been extraordinary and that people are saying enough, we've had enough. So how do we hold that uh, sense of suffering and the questioning about enough? And I find that in the midst of the experience of being pulled in many directions and the whirlwind of information, not knowing what we are listening to, that coming back to practice for me is essential. It is in that grounding of sitting every morning faithfully for me and then whatever Zoom call, phone call, letter comes through, I know sometimes I have to take that pain, that suffering into sitting again. So breathing deeply, allowing myself not to breathe in the anxiety and hold it, but allowing myself to breathe in an awareness of that and then being aware of just holding it gently as I encounter the other. For I believe strongly still that contemplative practice has an extraordinary impact on the way our brain operates and the way we deal with emotions. And that when we can breathe deeply, we realize that I am not my emotion. It has not taken over the essence of who I am, but I know it's there and I feel it. And that's important that I connect with those feelings, but also I am not those feelings. So letting that go in practice and then moving to action. So I sometimes I've gotten to that point of saying, here I am at this age with this concern medically, I can't be out doing X, Y, and Z, you know, and realizing that there is the word that always comes back that this is the time to which you have been born, for which you have been born. There is a work for you. And listening to what that work might be in the course of the day, it could be that phone call. It could be that letter from a duress white friend who is struggling with the fact that she's alienated all of her black friends and doesn't understand why they're no longer friends. Uh, and it is particularly obvious based on what she has said, you know, in terms of her questioning and challenging. So I'm so aware of that shift for me and for others in terms of what can we do? Uh, how do we live out of a contemplative space given the kinds of pandemic experience that we're having. The sense of communities becoming virtual meditation sessions, retreats, discussion groups, action focus groups, a la Zoom. We're spending so much time on Zoom, so sometimes it's almost the necessity of moving back from Zoom calls and breathing deeply. And so that's been a fascinating mixed bag of connecting for us, but not really connecting. It's like, as a friend of mine oft times said, or a number of people say, you know, the Zoom call was great, but it would have been great to have a cup of coffee after the meeting. 
uh, it would be great to have the hug. Uh, and we're missing that as a people and, and we really need that. So we find that using practice to be aware of what am I missing? What am I longing for? Desiring to make that connection, but desiring to be safe uh, and healthy and caring for others in their safety and healthy. It is that process of our practice that moves us deeper during these times and deeper in the way that we can reach out to others who are feeling marginalized and not connected. I'm absolutely amazed at the conversations I had. I called to place an order to get printer ink from Staples and you know, if you're using Zoom and you're using computers these days, finding printer ink sometimes is a challenge. So I got the young woman on the phone in Connecticut, or no, in Kentucky. And I thought, okay, the order is done. She was very good, found what I needed, order got processed. Then she got into, well, how are you doing in Massachusetts with this? Another 15 minutes later, I'm having this conversation with this woman in, Connect in Kentucky who, you know, in days past, there's no way that someone who is replacing or orders for you would spend that kind of time on the phone. But more than that, talking about her isolation and how difficult it is for her. And she said, you know, I've read enough books. I don't, I don't know what to do. I don't want to go out because I can't trust people to cook. I, you know, I know I wash my hands with my own spaghetti. So she was into that whole level of how do you deal with this isolation? And I was thinking about her and thinking, so many of us are privileged in the sense that we can go on the internet and find a million uh, meditation sites, a million practice sites, and can try and pu plug in. But that wasn't her orientation. It was like, you know, I'm reading books, but I can't go out. Uh, so part of what I find is we connect and share that deep listening when we're called to, even though, you know, I was not planning on spending 15 minutes talking to somebody about their life and how difficult it was. But that's what I was called to for that moment. Uh, and that's, that's what I really see as our response. Those of us who really may not be as uh, flexible or may not have the openness to travel around a bit. The sense of focusing on the oneness of humanity is so important. And it does not, we're not going to lose the awareness and attention uh, to those who are suffering at a pre in the present moment. And I think that, for me, is what contemplative practice does, that I can sit in the center of who I am with all of my marginal identities and be very connected across cultures and across ages and somewhat surprised at the ability to make that connection. And I think that becomes very important for us and our growing awareness of the environment and what we need to see that connection with one, um, human one sense of humanity or the oneness of it. His Holiness the Dalai Lama spoke of the need for secular ethics education in this country, in this world, and the sense of the meditation practices that would help us deal with destructive emotions as a way of moving to, bridging into, and understanding the oneness of all of humanity. But he also spoke about dialogue and the capacity to engage in dialogue with other. I think we come to that out of meditation because part of it is we have to be in touch with our own sense of who we are on the margins, if you will, uh, and how we may feel hurt, uptight, and upset. And then to be able to listen to the hurt, uptightness, and upset in the other. And that's the real call and challenge today. It's the mind boggling openness beyond boundaries, 
you know, in Ubuntu, I am because you are in that African philosophical thought. So it means that I can't create the in-group and be a part of the overall humanity. I must open myself up beyond this kind of protection of I've been victimized on the margin to be open to the humanity where others may have been victimized and are struggling to reach out as well. I think the other thing is that we gather wisdom from other spiritual practices or an understanding of other spiritual practices. One of the things that I was so moved by is uh, Kedron Bryant singing, I Just Want to Live. And I'm assuming if you haven't heard it, go on um, the internet. He, it's, the clip is there. The power of that comes out of the African-American gospel spiritual tradition. Uh, his mother, as an African-American woman with children in Jacksonville, I think Florida, every morning she meditated and prays. And the morning or shortly after George Floyd's uh, murder, she asked God, what can she say to you know, her 12-year-old son and his friends. And so she also has the kids structured in a way that they all have their devotional time before they start uh, their Zoom calls uh, and their homework and all. And what she did was came up to the words to uh, the song that I just want to live. And she gave it to Hinden and said, Go and meditate on this before you start your home, your schoolwork. And he did, and because he's musically inclined and really uh, sees himself as a singer, he then took those lyrics to a song. Uh, just briefly, the first reading from the first verse of what um, she wrote and what he sings. I just want to live. God protect me. I'm a young black man doing all I can to stand. Oh, but when I look around and I see what's being done to my kind every day, I'm being hunted as prey. My people don't want no trouble. We've had enough struggle. I just want to live. God protect me to stay right by my side. This is a call to all of us to protect the kin kingdom um, Bryant's in our lives or in our circles or as we see them out and about. How do we be faithful to a practice that enables us to sustain our strength and to let go of our boundaries in a way that we become more inclusive and see the one humanity and see the invitation to dialogue and see the invitation to not see this as a time of danger and uncertainty, but as a time of opportunity for a future on this earth where the earth and we can all live. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much, Dean Jacobs. Um, so uh, it, I, I know there's been uh, some questions coming. Uh, I think you can populate them in the chat. Uh, but we'll uh, just move directly on to um, Dean Hill's presentation. Um, and then after that, we'll have uh, some Q&A and open discussion. And then at the end, we'll have a very short meditation to close all of us together. We thought it would be important for we, we began together. We should also close everything together. So uh, Dean Hill, over to you. Thank you, Srini. And thank you all for, for being here today. It's, it's great. I see a lot of old friends in the audience. <laughs> Hello, welcome. And thank you, Hal, for uh, giving me the opportunity to come back and have some further dialogue with this group. I'm, I'm really appreciative that, you know, after seeing that tape, you wanted to come back and talk about it some more. So <laughs> that's great. And um, I also am appreciative of the, of the opportunity to have listened to Carolyn's talk and uh, I really got a lot from that and, and particularly this concept of Mbutu. 
and I think there's a lot to be developed there uh, in the activist spaces. Um, in terms of where I am these days, because that talk was three years ago, although there are a lot of parallels. I mean, I started off that talk talking about Confederate monuments, and I mentioned to my colleagues that yesterday in Richmond, the capitals of the Confederacy, uh, Stonewall Jackson finally came down. <laughs> And uh, it, it was quite a celebration. And we have this huge street called Monument Avenue. And there, there are about three others that are due to come down soon. So that's an interesting uh, phenomenon that's happening now. The other thing that I've been noticing in, in my personal life, in, in the, the midst of you know, the, the chaos and the pain and the suffering of the pandemic and of this upsurge in, in social consciousness and uh, the desire to, to stamp out racism, it just seems like such a time of opportunity uh, to restructure both the academy and I think contemplative practices will have a lot to do with that restructuring of the, the academy, but also the larger society. and. That's really continuing to be my main interest is how do I meld my my spiritual practices to my desire to bring about social justice in, in the world. And this has been going on uh, you know, all my life since I was born into a family that was involved in the civil rights uh, struggle. And it's been interesting to see the evolution of it from decade to decade, uh, from the 50s to the 60s, you know, being involved in the student movement in the 60s and the energy that we had then and comparing it to Black Lives Matter now, it's always the young people that are the agents of change. You know, they're the engines that, that drive uh, social change and, and betterment of society. So it's, it's been a great privilege of mine just to be associated with young people all these years as I had that career as an academic. In my talk, I was really uh, making two arguments at, simultaneously, neither one of which I think was fully developed, but I was looking at the way in which contemplative practices have been brought into the academic world. I've been part of that for, again, many decades. Uh, and when we started out, we were mainly looking at ways of uh, kind of validating the, the techniques. You know, we were doing research on the physiology of meditation or the, the psychosocial benefits of meditation. And, you know, reams of data have been acquired over the years. And there's almost a, a book ending. In, the, in my talk, I talked about the 1972 article that was in Scientific American by Benson and Wallace. And then almost 50 years later, there was another Scientific American article by Richie Davis and his associates uh, mapping out the neural pathways of various forms of meditation. So not just meditation generically, but the neural impact of different kinds of meditation, uh, you know, practices of compassion versus kind of a more indrawn meditation, absorptive meditation. And you do get these different patterns of activation in the brain. But I think the question is, and this is part of this upheaval in the academy, where do we go from here? What's the next question around contemplative practices that uh, we can address? And Hal alluded to it a little bit with his introduction to this term, uh, critical first person inquiry. Because one of the things about contemplative practices in their original context is that they were about producing states of consciousness. They weren't kind of vehicles for intellectualizing. And I think that distinction is important and the ability to have a way to produce those states makes the concepts come alive. So concepts like non-judgment and detachment as long as it's on the intellectual level, it always is a misapplication of the underlying teaching, which is not about 
intellectual withdrawal or emotional withdrawal or non-judgment is not about you know not being able to make discriminations between right action and wrong action but it's a, a larger holding of that space and it's it's anchoring in a, a level of being that's unshakable no matter how frenetic the times may get no matter how uh, much turmoil there is in the outer world, one can be anchored to a place inside that's absolutely stationary, not moving. And that's such an important platform by which to engage with the world. And in particular with social action, um, Carolyn was alluding to this a little bit in her remarks. You know, the, the idea of, of othering, that really racism is a subset of this larger tendency that's biologically based. I mean, some of this is hardwired into our brains to parse, parse the world into, you know, friend and foe or family and other or uh, friend and food, however it's parsed. But, uh, you know, that's a strong biological urge and tendency. And so it takes a lot of work to be able to get past that tendency of the brain, but it can be done. And most of these practices are designed to do that kind of transformation. So the idea though is that it requires sometimes intense effort, uh, prolonged effort. One of the things that really benefited me in my spiritual development was when I first started to meditate, uh, I had almost immediately this, what I would now call a transpersonal experience, an experience in which my sense of individuality just seemed to, to dissolve and I was part of this larger whole. There was no me or not me, it was just being and an isness. And even though that experience only lasted momentarily, it was transformative. Uh, if any of you have ever read William James' a Variety of Religious Experiences and he, his chapter on mysticism, he, he talks about the nature of, of these kinds of experiences to the people who have them. And one aspect of it is the, what he calls this noetic quality, that is the experience itself that produces the knowledge, that produces the wisdom. And so, it's very important as one progresses on the spiritual path to be able to have access to those deeper levels of experience. And it, it's wonderful that Hal, in, in the way he's designed his program, is giving students that opportunity for practice because it is through intense practice uh, that these deeper levels of consciousness can be uh, connected with. The other argument I was making was that this kind of uh, background is absolutely essential for uh, effective social action. That there's, you could almost think of it as stages of social action or activism. And most of us are in the stage where we use our emotions of anger and outrage against the other. And so, in a sense, we are reinforcing boundaries between ourselves and the opponent. And so we have to find a way beyond that if othering itself is one of the problems, if we're gonna to get to the point where we can have this sense of shared humanity, which by the way is another thing I think is, you know, is the consequence of, of the coronavirus that we've, we've started to have this more global perspective that it's almost like nature is showing us that we aren't isolated by country or, or ethnicity or culture, that there's something that transcends all of these distinctions while not erasing them. And that's the, the other point I was trying to make in my talk, that when we talk about oneness or having this experience of the oneness of humanity, it doesn't mean we can't celebrate cultural uniqueness. We can't celebrate the uniqueness of gender, the uniqueness of gender identity, the uniqueness of sexual orientation, whatever those unique experiences are, 
can be uh, celebrated. But the dominant aspect of our perception is this absolute connection with everyone and everything. So, um, you know, that, that's kind of an abstract concept. And the question is, if I were interested in proposing to uh, activist spaces to engage with contemplative practices, what are some effective ways of, of kind of engaging them? Um, one of the things that is part of this process is, is self-inquiry, you know, constantly kind of examining where you are in the process, you know, as we develop, uh, as, as we become woke, as you know, they're saying these days, we are awakening into another way of understanding, but that in itself is also a limiting framework. We have to always be ready to push through to an even deeper level of understanding, even deeper level. Uh, so the idea of kind of that righteous uh, indignation, that righteous certainty of our position is something that we need to have a, a, a means of getting out of. And it doesn't mean that we become less dedicated to the, to the goal of, whatever it is we're fighting for, justice or peace or uh, equality. But it means that, again, we, we are not walling ourselves off as, the, as in a sense of having the absolute answer. We're always a student. And that's one thing that's also been a, a benefit of my 50 year practice of meditation is that studentship is the constant that there's always a greater level of understanding to, to be had. And there's always something to be learned from everyone, uh, no matter how seemingly ignorant their position might be on the outside. Uh, there's something about the interaction that can be useful. So um, one of the things that I would like to see going forward, I, I retired from my academic position about six months ago. And I was really not ready for the change that I would make uh, in my life. I was assuming that I would still be going into the university and still doing my research and still keeping in touch with my graduate students. But it was like, I just took off the robe, so to speak, completely. <laughs> and uh, I find myself now wanting to offer not intellectual discussions about contemplative practices, but these deeper experiences, you know, to help people have a way of changing perception. Because again, we're not talking about adopting a new philosophy, even though in, in my talk, I was talking a lot about non-duality. I was talking about a lot of phys uh, philosophical positions, but it's not about the adoption of a new philosophy. It's about a change in the actual way in which you perceive the world change the relationship that you have between the object of perception and the subject of perception yourself. And in that change is where this growing sense of connection to humanity and to the universe as a whole starts to develop. And there are a lot of ways to, to cultivate this in addition to practices like meditation. There, anything one does and there's a Sanskrit term called seva, which means selfless service. Anything that one does in a selfless manner are ways that weaken that grip of the ego, that lead us to be able to pierce that barrier of the other and to see that, that underlying connection. And practicing virtues, like practicing compassion. I think I mentioned in the talk that uh, Richie Davidson's lab was doing this research on how by practicing uh, acts of compassion, you actually do become more compassionate. So all the virtues of that way, uh, practicing being loving, practicing being thoughtful, practicing being tolerant, practicing uh, any virtue you can think of is a technique for helping to develop that vision 
of non-duality and leading to this uh, sense of compassion. So all of those things dissolve that boundary between self and other. And it's that process that leads to a state that we could call detachment. And it's not detachment on the intellectual level or on the emotional level. You are fully engaged, all of your organs of perception and action, your ego, your mind, your, your, your intellect, your emotions are fully engaged with everything you're doing. But as an experiencer, you are situated in this transcendental, non-moving level of consciousness. And it's like when you're in that space, everything else lines up. It's like you, you have you bring balance to all these other facets of, of your life. So it's not one in the sense of the other. And you can be in that place of non-judgment, which again is not passive and it's not non-discriminatory. You can dis discriminate between right action and wrong action. You can discriminate what is the dharmic thing to do. What is the duty that should be done in this situation? And you can do it with force if necessary, but you can do it from a place of absolute love because that's ultimately what non-duality is. It's love absolute where there's no distinction between self or other. The love so, supreme. Love supreme, that's right, yeah. John Coltrane. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> wonderful. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Dean Hill. Um, so if, if uh, I mean, we have so much to, to, to think about with these reflections and um, beautiful and very wise uh, words from both of you, which I think uh, clearly born out of your deep and many long years of service and contemplation. So thank you both very much. Um, please, uh, everyone, feel free to uh, uh, drop your questions in the chat. Uh, Professor Roth will be moderating that with Anne. And uh, well, just to maybe I'll just start with uh, a, a little bit of discussion and, and uh, um, Dean Jacobs, you can turn your mic on too and feel free. We, we can try to keep it more open now. Um, so one, one theme of the many themes, I think that certainly um, overlapped between both of what you were, you were talking about was, you know, this, this whole idea of, you know, where is my, myself and where is this other? And, not, and, and, and I like, uh, uh, Oliver, you were mentioning, you know, just that othering is the large category and racism maybe is, is one subset of that sex that all these other isms can be, but othering just the, it's the self versus something else, whatever it may be, um, as a, as a fundamentally, um, critical, like juncture of consciousness that one must meditate on, one must contemplate, uh, that, um, and, uh, both of you mentioned also, you know, the, uh, the Ubuntu phrase, uh, and I, I thought maybe Carolyn, if we can, we can just start with this, the, the difference that you see between the interpretation of I am because you are versus I am because we are. And what, what kind, I mean, that's a very, you know, it's a small mm -hmm. shift, mm -hmm. but uh, conceptually, it's actually quite profound. Um, and I think you, you yes. did talk about this a little, and I, w I just wanted to see if you could kind of expand <laughs> on that in this context. Yes. Uh, Michael Ezzi, who corrected us, you know, we did a, Mind and Life did a um, dialogue in Botswana. Unfortunately, His Holiness became ill and wasn't able to attend. Uh, but Michael, we had talked about the whole sense and all that I had read before was I am because we are. And he said that was not the correct translation it is i am because you are because the minute i define we or talk about we i'm defining an in group and a tribe um you know a race etc uh, etc et so if i then think i am because you are then i move to being in dialogue and in relationship yeah. And I know I love you. Hmm. And that that transcends my sense of the we group. Uh, and, you know, for Americans, oftentimes, the sense of even trying to think about a we group is hard enough. Yeah. 
you know, it's sort of like, uh, you know, I, I've got enough groups in my life, let alone <laughs> something that's going to take on a particular identity for me. Yeah. But that sense of all of humanity. And uh, I think, as you know, with an Indian philosophical thought, that kind of interdependent relationship is much more you than we. And so I think, you know, uh, His Holiness and Jhimpala would very much uh, have enjoyed, or Jhimpala did because he was there, enjoyed that conversation yeah. uh, because it moved our thinking to a very different dimension and out of the kind of strong in-group thing that right. all of a sudden we join in the big circle and then there are people in other circles and that's fine. Right. I mean, because if you hear the saying, you think I am because we are sounds very nice. You know, are we, oh, that's wonderful. But if you look deeper into the psychology of it, uh, we actually, you know, reifies more boundaries. And actually right. that separation of I and you, which we have to accept as a, as a reality mm -hmm. of our, you know, our, our being, that's the thing that actually creates, you know, a, a, you know, you don't exist without the other, right. that, in a sense. Um, mm -hmm. So beautiful. Um, Dean Hill, would you like to comment on that? To, uh, also, that othering and the, the okay, self. Please call me Oliver. <laughs> all right, all right. I, I'm just doing it because I know like uh, the students are there. But okay, thanks, Oliver. <laughs> <laughs> and please call me Srini or whatever. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. I was, you... I was just thinking about. Uh, this from a perspective of Indian philosophy. Uh, and I, I think I mentioned in the talk two kinds of non-duality that you find in Indian philosophy. One is the Vedantic approach, which in a sense negates the, the manifest world to say that the, the other, the manifest is illusory. It is just the absolute. Versus something like uh, Kashmir Shaivism, which says that the, the, the manifest, the creation is co-eternal with the the unmanifest or the the creator that the process is is going on outside of time so it's all there it's all eternal and in in a sense that's like what happens with the other that the other is reconciled with self and the, the small as self you know in this one whole um so it, it's kind of an interesting perspective and i think it's something that that is one of the revolutions that might be about to take place in the academy because the western epistemology is the exact opposite is mm -hmm. the analytic approach breaking things up into pieces and then seeing what the pieces are and assuming that the pieces are fundamental yeah, versus yeah. assuming that the whole is fundamental yes exactly um which yeah and, and we should have a whole other discussion about that the whole epistemological kind of a situation that we're in because you know we we're, we're working in that western model still uh and and our education system is in that model and so it is sometimes difficult to kind of uh, make an, an argument for example uh teaching contemplative practices is something that would be beneficial for a holistic education um you know it's certainly something that uh took a long time to get even at, at a place like brown and and so anyway mm -hmm. there there is a lot uh, on that side of uh the discussion one thing that i'd love to hear more about um i know oliver like you know your father was deeply involved with many cases and and you know you grew up just in that life of of, of seeing um you know the whole civil rights movement unfold itself um and i'm i'm really curious to hear from both of you uh, just to get a little bit of your sense and perspective of how you see what was happening back then, what happened, you know, over the years, what even happened at Charlottesville the last time you were here compared to what's happening now. And if you can kind of just give us a sense of what you see is the same, what you see is different, what you, uh, you know, kind of feel hopeful about, um, that would be really, you know, really nice. Carolyn, you going first or you want me to go first? You can go first. I don't mind. Yeah. <laughs> go ahead, Oliver. Well, I, I see. This, I definitely see the the continuity of the of the movement. Uh, and again, I, I use that image of spirals. That uh, you know, it's not like it's a linear function. It just it's always ever upward. We do 
have these fits and starts and retrenchments after gains and that, that kind of thing. But, uh, you know, you know, the Brown case was 60, 60 years ago, and we still have dese dese haven't desegregated schools yet. Uh, so in some sense, it, it seems like, well, you could, you could get frustrated and say, well, nothing has changed. But on the other hand, a lot has changed. And what, one of the things that's changed now in terms of this current movement is the energy of it. And there's this sense, there was some kind of breakthrough. You can feel when, some, when something is penetrated and there's a breakthrough. You know, it was that way a couple of years ago with gay marriage. Everybody was against it and all of a sudden they weren't anymore. It was the same thing with the removal of the statues here in Richmond. Everybody was against it, and then suddenly they weren't anymore. They finally got it. You know, there was something that, that caused that penetration. So, it, and in terms of my spiritual life, I see what I was doing all my life in terms of my identity and figuring out where how I fit into this larger culture. All that was part of my spiritual growth and spiritual practice. So I, I see it as one kind of continuous sweep. Uh, that's going on, continuing. <laughs> Wonderful. Carolyn? I think what I have been so struck by was, is the number of young people across race and ethnic groups that are out there together and are out there supporting one another. Uh, and I think a lot of folks who are older who have been there are just trying to catch up with young people who are on the front line and who are determined that this is not the way it has to be. Uh, and I'm listening to people that I know who are dealing with 15 year olds and understanding that they have a different sense of the world and justice and a different consciousness about that and are challenging their parents, their white parents to say, no, this is not right, you know. Could be that everybody's spending too much time at home together. <laughs> <laughs> and it just, and people are having conversations. See, this is what is also wonderful, <laughs> is that families are, are having to have conversations that are very uncomfortable uh, because there's no place to run off to. You know, there's no soccer games, there's no whatever to make the great escape from. I think there's this interesting dip into consciousness that's opened up because so much has converged together at the same time. And people then begin to realize that this is not working. The system is not working. People look at the United States, and then they look at Europe and others. And for the first time in my lived experience, and I think probably in the history, the Europeans are saying, nope, you're not doing good public health. You can't come. <laughs> you know? Have you ever heard that we could not go to, to Europe because of our public health practices? All of this is turned upside down in a way. And what I find, because I, I feel that, uh, uh, Oliver, what you will find too, is having been an academic, having been a dean and used to students and engagement, and even with retirement very much, all of a sudden, I am home and a hermit. You know, I sort of wait on somebody to deliver food to me and, you know, I maintain some connection but I'm having to think about my own practice and, and what that means and how that grounds me when I don't have the physical social community around me. And I have to accept the fact that, yeah, I'm gonna struggle with this, but it's okay. So for young people, I just wish them the strength of practice to carry them through and knowing that um, we're in this for a while. This is not going to be a quick solution anywhere. Uh, and the only thing I can say is I wish they'd stay out of bars and breaches. Yeah. You know, because this, this, <laughs> the issue of being, it's like the, those of you who have children, it's like 
the three-year-old who's all powerful and can go running into the street or anywhere because the world is going to stop for him or her. Um, we have young people who say, well, I'm not going to get it. And then some wake up and realize that they have. Uh, so you've got that going on as well as those who are determined to affect the change. But one of the things that's been interesting is I think, and somebody can correct me, that the testing for uh, COVID-19 for people who have been protesting has not been any higher than in the general population as a whole. So there had been this expectation that the protest would increase it. I think what's increased is the absence of social distancing in close spaces. So what we have are young people who are looking at ways to maybe take care uh, but also to not be shut down, you know. Dr. Uh, Ellen Flynn is confirming that on the chat. That is correct. So Good. we have some questions. Ah, great. In the chat. Um, and I think uh, in order, Jillian, uh, Jacob, and then Beth. So yeah. I'm so Jillian uh, has the first question. And here you go, Jillian. You can ask it uh, directly. Okay. Um, I was wondering in the effort to bring contemplative practices to social justice movements, how can we navigate issues of spiritual bypassing? Spiritual bypassing, did you mm -hmm. guys? Yeah, I'll take, I'll take that one. Uh, okay. Yeah, that, that's a very important question. And I think it has to go back to what I was saying before about the meaning of terms like non-judgment and detachment that spiritual bypassing is the exact outcome of the misuse of those kinds of concepts. That spirituality uh, is thought to be a way of kind of papering over the problems in society. In fact, I've had in, in many activist spaces, I've had a challenge with things like teaching meditation in inner city communities, particularly in the schools. Because the, the challenge was, well, doesn't just this make the, the students are more accommodative to their oppression, to their uh, their situation. And true spirituality does not. Right. True spirituality is uh, invigorating and it's, uh, it's definitely motivating to bring about change in the world, but it's powered by love rather than anger or rather than mm -hmm. frustration. Uh, but it's a constant uh, danger that people need to do that kind of self-inquiry I was mentioning before, because it is a, a possibility to, you know, misapply a teaching, particularly if you're just looking at a teaching, you read a teaching in a book and you say, oh, that sounds good. Uh, the Buddha was non-attached. Uh, non <laughs> But uh, it's not just a matter of ad adapting that as an attitude. One has to do the work to produce that state of consciousness uh, in order not to fall into. I mean, there was a Sufi uh, character named Nasruddin who used to always misapply spiritual teachings. <laughs> uh, you know, it was a, he was a Kamko character as a way of teaching that this is not what you do. <laughs> this is not the way to practice non-attachment or whatever the teaching might be. It, it also helps to be practicing um, with uh, other activists who can kind of call us on uh, on times when we fall into that. Mm -hmm. In a way right. that it helps to practice in community. You know, you can do spiritual bypassing on an individual level in which mm -hmm. you can actually, as emotions come up, you can go, okay, I'm not attached to that. Let's go with that. I don't need to deal with that. So spiritual bypassing can occur both on it individual level as well as a social and political level yes and one other thing i would recommend too is to have a living teacher <laughs> yeah yeah someone yeah. who can kind of keep you straight as you are meandering through your spiritual life <laughs> yes i think the other thing is that Apparently. people oftentimes engage um in spirituality or spirit or contemplative practice to, trying to say well i'm going to figure out a way not to suffer not to feel the suffering. And if I do, that technique isn't working for me. So I need to try another technique or find another book uh, so that I can avoid because I want to live a peaceful life. I do not want to offend or upset anybody. 
And if I do that, then I need to just look at another way of practicing. So the fact that um, spirituality or contemplative practices are hard work, faithfulness to it is the, the byword or what one needs to do, and you're not going to win, you know? There's, there are no gold stars at the end of this because what happens is the glue becomes unstuck and then you have to go back. Off times and start all over again. Right. So uh, we have one more question. Uh, another question from mm -hmm. student uh, Jacob. Uh, you can go ahead and ask your question. Sure. I was wondering, uh, yeah, I'm going to that, about how uh, like when we kind of meet the limits of our compassion, when we meet those people, especially in these situations, whether it's, you know, political figures or um, people who are, you know, proliferating racism, how do we kind of keep that feeling of connection and compassion for them? Because it, it seems like that can be a powerful tool for transformation, maybe not the only tool for change and transformation, but definitely a powerful one. Yes, definitely. And, and the way you described it is, is exactly why it's so powerful, you know, that uh, first of all, you could think of every experience as an opportunity to practice. And we practice to get better at something. So it doesn't mean we start off <laughs> being able to, to do this. <laughs> so it, it, so that you also have to have compassion for yourself as you are developing. So it might be difficult in the beginning not to be able to you know, to control your anger when you see someone who's exhibiting overt racism. Uh, just, you know, you do the best you can. You use that opportunity to practice because just having the awareness of the emotion is the first step uh, yes. because it hasn't now completely taken, taken you away. Mm -hmm. You now are able to, to maintain some awareness in the moment while the emotion is there. And so that's very important. Uh, but you don't beat yourself up about it. You just, you know, each time you practice, you will get better, but it might take a while, particularly with, you know, the most extreme cases. <laughs> I'm still working on, you know, President Trump. I'm still... Uh, <laughs> yes, a lot of us are. <laughs> hard on that one, but, uh, but also, you know, you can recognize that it, it, it's like, think of it as like weights. That, that's the big barbell, you know, that's, that's building your muscles up. You mm -hmm. know? You don't go to that first. You might want to start with the dumbbells first. I yeah. think so. Uh, perhaps a, an example that I have from years ago, I was working in Louisiana for about a year and with a uh, group, I was the only uh, with a spiritual group that I spent time with and they would do, they're all white and what would happen in the celebrations or food. And you know, it was always this wonderful Cajun food and all. And when there would be this party, they'd eventually get into singing, I wish I was in Dixie. And I thought, I gotta get out of here. Mm -hmm. uh, because I thought, I how am I sitting with 20 other people? And that's the, the song for the evening to, you know, as a part of it. When I had spent the year with them, I had gone through helping people plan a funeral, helping people plan a wedding, helping people deal with a divorce, helping people deal with a host of personal crisis because, you know, I was a social worker and I just sort of exude that kind of support for families or whomever. When I left and they saw, you know, part of the gathering and the food, and then they did I wish I was in Dixie. And I thought, you know, part of what I got connected with is those strong connections and relationships. So while that song triggered something in me, I had gotten to know these 20 folks and families in all sorts of ways. And they had been so caring for me personally when I had a health problem, People just said, don't worry about it. We'll take care of you. And they did. And if I had not had that experience, I would never risk having a conversation with somebody I knew came deeply out of those roots. Today, I can engage that because I know the capacity for a relationship. 
Now, the universe has blessed me, so I am nowhere in the circle of Donald Trump. So I don't have to try and have that interaction up close. But I do have a commitment to meditating that includes wishing him what I see as important conversion in his own life of way of thinking and the healing of whatever is going on within him. Because he is a part of this world and he has a major impact on it. So I can't give my anger over to how do I spend time struggling with that. But I also don't deny the injustice. And I don't deny that things need to change and that, you know, it's going to take the power of meditation and people voting to get that done. May he have a long vacation. <laughs> yes. <Yeah>. Yes. <laughs> a long time to work on himself. Um, yes. Uh, one of the, one of the uh, uh, wonderful things that I learned from uh, a previous life, a previous incarnation working with the Canadian Friends Service Committee, the Quakers, is uh, this basic Gandhian principle that you can hate a deed, but try not to hate the doer. Yeah. And, and I've come to understand that there's a deeper uh, contemplative philosophy that underlies that. And that um, I derive that both from Hindu and Buddhist traditions that um, as human beings, we're not fixed and permanent selves. We're constantly flowing and constantly changing and constantly mm -hmm. moving. And everyone, potentially everyone is, is changeable and educable. So at a particular moment in their lives, when they, when they, uh, they do a deed which is, which is offensive and objectionable, it doesn't mean that they need to be permanently identified as the person who did that deed. And if we keep that in mind and keep that sense of perspective, you know, that we can detest what some people do, mm. but try to avoid at all costs detesting them as human beings, right. it's very, very helpful. And it's very difficult to do that as an intellectual exercise. Right. It really, really helps to, to have a grounding in contemplative practice to be able to see that. Mm -hmm. Right. Very correct. We have, we have a follow-up from Indy Shom. Uh, oh, it was an early uh, contemplative studies concentrator. And don't forget, we also, there's a question also from uh, Beth. Beth, yeah, oh, got it. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't want to jump ahead of Beth. If... No, I, you so, said that okay. this, this was in Yeah, yeah, it was uh, right? in relationship yeah, so, to uh, what Jacob asked and what um, all three of you professors just spoke about. And I really appreciate it because obviously that some version of this is playing out in all of our minds right now, right? How to, how to approach the other in self right now. And, you know, Donald Trump, I, I share the same view with, I can meditate about him because uh, thank God I don't have to talk to him. Thank all the gods, you know. Um, but when it's a close friend or a family member, um, I've found it's been a challenge for me to distinguish uh, what Dr. Hill, you talked about as strong dharmic action um, and yet compassion and selflessness. And what I've found sometimes is I guess boundaries is maybe the corresponding word in, in modern psychology. And then the question about it. what I found sometimes is that these questions of like trauma and gaslighting and selflessness and these power dynamics get really blurry sometimes. And even when it's a friend that you care about and that underlying compassion is um, established, uh, maybe if I can use your example, uh, Dr. Jacobs, if you were in that church or, and, and they were singing Dixie and like, I don't know if you had this experience, but if you brought up that that was not something great, what would the reaction have been? And if they were like, now you're being a jerk, get out of our group. How do you, how do you navigate that? And what is the, yeah, I, I don't know. Am I, should I, am I being a friend by sticking around and, or am I being not a friend by not being strong and clear about what, what is the truth here, that I, as far as yeah. I can see? Well, in that situation, I had to be aware of how they treated me. And what I found is that they cared for me as another human being, okay? And they had their own particular issues around racial issues and stuff and history and stuff and all of that. Um, 
but the sense of that compassionate connection as they were growing and struggling with the issues. Uh, so I think part of it was I had to deal with how do I allow history to keep me uh, and experience to keep me from engaging with you as another human being. And so approaching it that way, you know, now if, if somebody had decided they were going to burn my car and throw me out, you know, I clearly um, had enough sense that that was not a place to be. But winding up with people who wanted to make sure that I was okay in circumstances. And, you know, I, I joke about it, but I had the best time learning how to cook gumbo with a 90 year old Cajun woman who barely spoke English, uh, but we drank a lot as we got the roux the right color and the whole nine yards. And I thought, this had to be an experience for her to be teaching this African-American woman about cooking <laughs> gumbo, <laughs> you know. So, so, you know, it opens you up to possibilities that are quite uh, enriching and transformative and prepares you for the next step because I've since, you know, and particularly now encountered friends that, uh, who are from the South, well-educated, that I thought had worked through some of this, and now I'm listening to them say things in ways that are offensive to other people, and they're trying to figure out why. And so I'm having to say, this is why that's offensive. Mm -hmm. I love you, but you can't do that. <laughs> you can't say that and expect other Blacks to accept you. And Indy, so, you were mentioning too about uh, family and, and close friends. Sometimes those are the most difficult. Oh, yeah. yeah. And so yeah. you have to work up on your muscles, you know. But as you oh, yeah. continue to expand your consciousness, there is an intuition too about what to say, what to press, yes. you know, what to yes. do, when to, when to not do something. Yeah. There's an element of surrender too. So when you do take action, mm -hmm. you can be surrendered in terms of the fruits of that action. You mm -hmm. know? Mm -hmm. and it might not convince them this time, but mm -hmm. it was the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. So we have one last question. I think we can get in by uh, another one of our concentrators, Beth. Hi. Um, yeah, uh, a lot of uh, my question has uh, been covered, which is really nice. Um, but uh, as we were saying, uh, many contemplative practices can like build this sense of compassion and openness, as um, Dr. Jacobs was saying. Um, which felt, which fosters sort of like this this different perception of what is community, you know, what is humanity, you know, what is this we we're talking about, this oneness. Um, and so when it comes to perceiving the world in a different way, to perceiving our, our place in it in a different way, getting a broader perspective, when does that, I guess, transition into action towards justice? Because so much of um, a, a large critique of the mindfulness movement, especially in the West, is that, you know, it's it can render us quite complicit and quite passive. Um, so I, I really, I liked um, what you were saying, Dr. Hill, in your um, open discussion about, you know, leading with love leads into action. Um, but I guess my question is, at what point do we know that we're, it's the right time to lead into action? And um, how do we teach that better so that the actions that we take are kind and well-intentioned? Yeah. And uh, again, that's the fruit of, of the practice. Yeah. You, know, but, uh, you can teach people to practice and then hopefully they will get to the point where they are making yeah. those good decisions. Uh, mm -hmm. But in terms of, of when to take action, take every action you can all the time. Uh, and uh, yeah, what I find is that as I've gotten deeper in, in my practice, my desire for action has also deepened and expanded that I want to take action. I don't want to be passive when I'm seeing injustice or when I'm seeing someone being mistreated. But it also it gives me a discrimination. So I'm not just responding in anger in the moment, mm -hmm. but I'm able to, you know, kind of evaluate the situation and try to do the thing that's going to be most effective. But you don't have to wait. It's not like you meditate for a while until you get good enough and then you can go do the, the action. Go take the action now. Get down to the protest now. But at the same time, you know, continue to uh, 
do that inner work as well. Yeah. And that's so important that you do the inner work because you also have to discern what is my intention in the action that I'm about to take. You know, what, what is informing this? Also, can I hold uh, my anger, frustration, name it, understand it in ways that I don't create violence when I'm out wandering, walking, trying to take the right action for the benefit of everyone, not just my own ego. And that I think derives from contemplative intelligence, developing contemplative intelligence and seeing um, how you interact with others um, in light of that. Um, Wonderful. So and you're right, Hal, it was about having a good teacher as well. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. and Oliver, you know, I think that whole sense of, I, can I can't that. do this alone. I can't yes. do this alone. Can't thank our teachers enough. Um, I mean, I studied with Professor Roth like 25 years ago, so he was my oh. my first contemplative studies teacher. <laughs> Savior of education, all you guys. <laughs> so at this point, I mean, we could go on having uh, long discussions, um, but uh, let us uh, close together. Oliver was going to lead us uh, through a 10-minute meditation to take us out and uh, settle this back in because, you know, a lot of things get... Uh, stirred up so always good to again calm the mind and uh oliver should you let me know when to hit the bell and i'll do it okay well uh you mean the bell to start or the bell to end the bell to start okay um well i was just going to give a few quick instructions maybe we don't maybe we can just slide into it and then have a bell at the end okay so i'll, I'll here we're sliding in okay <laughs> very good <laughs> So as we've been saying, you know, meditation is not developed as a treatment modality for stress, but as a way of experiencing the depths of consciousness beyond the thinking level of the mind. So it's not a tool for suppressing emotion, but a method for becoming anchored in a, a deeper level of being so that we're not buffeted about by our emotions. And this is what gives us the ability to do the work that must be done from a place of love and compassion. So you can start by just finding a comfortable posture. And take a few full breaths in and out. And you can gently close your eyes. And start just by noticing the contents of your awareness, whatever might be there already, the thoughts, the feelings, the sensations. If you have feelings of anger, just notice the texture of that anger. The visceral sensations that might be there from a feeling of frustration or hurt or impatience. Don't interfere with any of the feelings. Just, just witness what's there. And now let your awareness expand to the connection with your surroundings. You can feel rooted to the seat below you. And you can feel rooted to the earth beneath that. Just feel the strength and stability that comes from your connection to the earth. And become aware of the web of relationships in your life and the strength that comes from that connection. Imagine that web of relationships expanding backward in time all the way to a common ancestor for all of humanity. Have a sense of expansiveness in your inner space. Entertain the idea that there are no boundaries to your awareness. It's 
So in this feeling of connection and boundlessness, let's just sit for a moment.
I want to <clears throat> thank everybody for joining us this afternoon uh, and particularly thank uh, Dean Jacobs and Dean Hill for wonderful presentations. Very interesting and provocative and uh, it's, it's, been, it's been wonderful. It's been a pleasure. Thank you all. Be well, stay safe, meditate daily.